Well, good to be with you in God's house on Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. I'm glad that you all took the time to come out and make steps into the house of God. There's no greater place to be in, than in the house of God with God's people around the Word of God and worshiping Him and spending time in His presence. And um, I just want to thank Pastor Craig for the inviting us to come and spend and do these revival services with you. It's always a pleasure to come up here to Haverhill, Mass, and uh, visit Changing Lives Church. And I'm uh, glad my wife has joined me in this trip. And um, we've had some good services the last two nights. And um, God's been speaking some things into our heart. And um, I don't think he's done yet. We're going to um, continue to trust God that he's going to continue to speak relevant things into our lives, practical things that will Help us to become the people of God that he would desire for us to be and to live in revival. Amen? Revival is not just about a weekend. It's not just about a few services. It's about a way of life that God wants us to be people of the Spirit, people that walk in the Spirit, people that live in the Spirit. Amen? And um, we see a lot of people, you know, we're all born the same way. We're born a natural birth. We're born into this world with a sinful nature. We're born with a nature that doesn't want to walk in the ways of God. It doesn't know much about the things of God. And that's why it's important for us as parents to teach our children and train them up in the way that they should go. That when they'd be old, they'd not depart from it. Uh, I think about in the olden days when we look into the Old Testament scriptures, how the parents, the Hebrew parents, had a mandate by God that they were to meditate upon the scriptures, talk about the Ten Commandments day and night. It was ever to be in, in the forefront of the lives of the Hebrew children. They were to learn the ways of God at an early age that, you know, that they might not go astray as they went older. Amen. They would learn how to pray. They would learn how to read the Word of God. They would learn how to worship God in the sanctuary. They would learn how to live as a life of a Christian. Amen. But it's not really like that in America, unfortunately, in most households. People talk very little about the things of God. I, I think of me growing up as a young man, um, even before, um, I, I didn't hear much about Jesus pro probably um, in, in my whole uh, childhood life. You know, my parents, I, I don't even know if they had a Bible. I might have gone to church a handful of times in my whole uh, childhood life. I mean, shame on my parents, not to bash them. They both got saved, and they, they both came to faith in Christ. But, um, you know, during the times of my adolescence, that wasn't what we were taught in my house. And how many knows when uh, a child is taught the wrong way, the wrong direction? You know, children, they mimic their parents. They want to become like mom. They want to become like dad. And when mom and dad are doing the wrong things, you know, it just leads the child in the wrong direction. And uh, those of you that weren't here, the first two services, we had some good services. The first night we talked about, you know, how that God's people, they're ignorant of the judgments of God. They don't understand how God really operates. They, they, have a, they, they fabricated a God in their own mind that's not the God of the scriptures. They, they, they see God in a certain way, but they don't see God in the way that he really is. You know, this, this God is a dynamic God. This God is a God that's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's all-present. There's nothing too hard for him. His arm's not too short. His ear's not too deaf. He's able to, he owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. He's the creator of all mankind. He's the master of the universe. He's the fairest among 10,000. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright and morning star. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the captain of the Lord's host. We serve an awesome God, my friends. But a lot of us, we have an image of a very small God. You know, but this God, can kill, he can cure cancer by just speaking the word. He can cure heart disease by just speaking the word. You know, we have doctors and we have surgeries and we have medicine and all these are good things because every situation is not going to be, you know, cured with a miracle. You know, unfortunately, a miracle is a rare event. It happens occasionally. But it doesn't happen all the time. So God uses these other things that are at his disposal to minister to the needs of people because he loves us. Amen? But, um, you know, we're not, we're not always cognizant of, of the way that God really is. 
You know, God is a God of love. God is a God of mercy. He's a God of compassion. He's a God of grace. He's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. You know, God could even be your friend if you'll walk in his ways. You know, you can be his servant. You can have close, intimate relationship with him where he speaks things into, it, into your life and you can hear his voice and he can lead and direct your life. And, um, but God is, you know, he, although he's our savior, although he's our healer, although he's our deliverer, although he's all these good things to us, he's our provider, he's also going to be our judge one day. Every one of us will stand before God one day. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after that the judgment. You're going to stand before God one day, and you're going to give an account of your life. And not one of you are going to be able to stand before God and be found not guilty because of your good conduct. Because there's none righteous, no not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the Father has laid upon the Son the iniquity of us all. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Just one sin, my friends, will take you to a devil's hell. Hell was never prepared for the people of God. Hell was prepared for the devil and the demonic spirits that follow him. But sin will take you to hell. Sin will cost you more than you're willing to pay. It'll keep you longer than you're willing to stay. You know, sin is detrimental to your life. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. God loves people this morning. God realizes that you were born with a sinful nature and I was born for a, with a sinful nature. And he made a new and living way that we might escape the flames of hell, my friends. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's through faith in Christ. It's through putting your confidence in someone that died on an old rugged cross for you and paid your sin debt that you might live and spend eternity with God and his people in a place called heaven and escape a devil's hell. Amen. And that's good news this morning. But, but the, God's people are ignorant of his judgments. They don't understand his ways. They got, this, they got this picture of God created in their own mind. They see God as a Santa Claus in the sky, a lot of them. And a lot of it's been done through these televangelists, these certain preachers. They preach certain things and they give you a misguided understanding of who God really is. This God is a serious God. He's serious that you're going to live a holy life. He's serious that you're going to obey the Ten Commandments. He's serious that you'll walk in His ways and you'll live a righteous life. He's serious that you'll live a life of faithfulness, a life of obedience, that you'll talk right and you'll act right and you'll walk right and you'll not touch wicked things and you'll not go wicked places with your feet. This God is serious that you'll live a life that pleases Him. And he's so serious that he allowed the Son of God to have Roman soldiers drive nails through his hands and pierce his feet that you might live and not die, spiritually speaking. Amen. This God, you know, but when we're ignorant of the judgments of God, we think that, that God is not looking all the time. That we can get over if the, dark, if the lights are real dark or if we're in a back alley or we're with our friends and nobody else is around and mom and dad don't see, we think we can get over Every time we smoke marijuana, every time we pop a pill, every time we get drunk, every time we have sex before marriage, every time we lie and steal, not one time, my friends, will you get over. God sees everything that you do. He hears every word that comes from your mouth. He even understands the thoughts that come into your mind. This God is serious that you'll live a holy life. But the people of God are ignorant of the judgments of God. And because that, they don't even understand that God is correcting them. They don't even understand that when they're being punished. People, they talk about God bless America. You know, you hear it all the time, these politicians, God bless America. And you know, I wish God would bless America, and I wish God could bless America. But God is faithful to his word, my friends. 
God is not going to bless a people that live a sinful life. And until America repents corporately, amen, until America turns back to the God of their forefathers, God is not blessing America. And you can look back in the Old Testament scriptures, make no mistake about it, the nation of America and most of the nations of the world are under the curse of God because the people in the nations have been breaking the commandments of God for years now. And you can read it. Read it for yourself when you go home. Deuteronomy chapter 28. It speaks of those that will keep the commandments of God will be a blessed people. You want God to bless you? You want God to bless your family? Keep the commandments of God. These aren't suggestions, my friends. These are things that are written with the finger of God on tables of stone as a perpetual ordinance to all generations. In other words, they were not just for the Hebrew children back in two or 3,000 years ago. They're still applicable today in 2021. God still expects you to have no other gods before him and make no graven image of anything in heaven or the earth below. He still expects expects us to honor our parents. He still expects us to keep the Sabbath day holy. He still expects us to not take his name in vain. He still doesn't want us to lie or steal or murder or commit adultery or covet our neighbor's property. He still wants us to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. He still wants us to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly before him and be steadfast, unmovable, abounding in his work. He still wants us to love him and serve him and fear him and walk in his ways and keep his statutes and keep his commandments. These aren't suggestions. But many people think that God is winking at their sin. They think that they can sin and get over with God. I can have a little bit of Jesus and I can have a little bit of reefer. I can have a little bit of Jesus, and I can get drunk once in a while. I can have a little bit of Jesus, and I can go have sex with my boyfriend or my girlfriend. I can have a little bit of Jesus, and I can cuss when I get mad. I can have a little bit of Jesus, and I can lie when I think I can get away with it. I can have a little bit of Jesus, and I can steal when I think I can get away with it. But that doesn't work, my friends, because every transgression and every act of disobedience gets a just recompense of reward. God's serious about us getting it right. We spoke last night about coming under the yoke of the Lord Jesus Christ. This thing about a yoke is when two animals, they're put together with this wooden thing. It comes around one neck and it comes around the other neck. It's so that they can walk and they can do the work and they can work together in a unified way. You know, a lot of us as Christian people, we think we can do this thing called Christianity without the help of the Holy Spirit. But you can't live a life, my friends, that pleases God unless the Holy Spirit comes into your life and helps you. That's why Jesus told the great teacher in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. To see or enter the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. It says the natural man doesn't even understand the things of the spirit because they're spiritually discerned. You got to come to a place, my friends, where you repent of your sins and you confess Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life and you believe that God raised him from the dead and then you'll be saved and you'll be born again of the Spirit and you'll have the ability and the power to lead a life that pleases God. Aside from that, my friends, you'll always be a failure. You'll always make mistakes. You'll always sin against God. You need the Holy Ghost. And I need the Holy Ghost. And it's not a one-time event, my friends. It just happens when you become born again. And you go on and live your life that pleases you. When you become born again of the Spirit of God, my friends, you're not your own anymore. You've been bought with a price. You've been bought and paid for by the precious blood of Jesus. You're a bondservant to the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you surrendered your life to the man who had nails put through his hands and through his because he died and he loved you so much he gave you a chance that you might live spiritually hallelujah that's good news but he expects something from you 
He expects that you will begin to follow in his ways and you'll begin to put your neck under that yoke. In other words, you're not calling the shots anymore. In other words, you're not speaking the words you want to speak anymore. You're not going the places you want to go anymore. You're not thinking the thoughts you want to think anymore. But you're going to begin to operate in the ways of God. You're going to begin to let the Bible read you as you read the word of God until it shows you a good reflection of what you look like spiritually speaking. See, the word of God is alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides asunder between joints and marrow. It's the cern of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. The Bible tells us to study to show ourselves approved and rightly divide the word of God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. God wants us to love this word. You want to be a prosperous person? You want to be a blessed person? Be like the psalmist in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way with sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by rivers of water, bringing forth fruit in his season, and his leaf won't wither, and whatever he'll do would prosper. God wants to change us, my friends. I want to speak to you this morning about J Jeremiah chapter... Um, We want to look into the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 12. Verses 1 through 5. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yet let me talk with you of your judgments. Wherefore does the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? You've planted them, yea, you, they've taken root. They grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. You are near in their mouth and far from their reins. But you, Lord, you know me, you've seen me, and you've tried my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. How long shall the land mourn? and the herbs of every field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. The beasts are consumed in the birds because they say, he shall not see our last end. Listen to verse 5. I want you guys to get a hold of this. If you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein you trusted, they wearied you, then what will you do with the swelling of the Jordan? Bow your heads, we'll pray for this sermon. Father God, we just pray for this sermon this morning, God, that, Lord, that you might speak into our lives today some words that would be helpful to us. God, that you might help us to understand spiritual things this morning. God, that you might speak through your Holy Spirit, God, and open up our ears to hear what your Spirit would say to the church today, Lord. God, anoint your manservant, hide me behind the cross, and let me speak forth words that would be relevant and revolutionary to this congregation, words that would be helpful in the days ahead, and words that would bless them, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. Here you have Jeremiah. He's at a He's at a low point in life. He's, a, he's been called from the womb. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 1, it says, be, you know, even before you were born, I called you and I've appointed you to be a prophet unto the nations. He said he was put over kings and he was put over priests. He was put over rulers. He was put over the, all, all, all the whole land. Jeremiah had the spiritual authority over the whole land. This was, his, this was what was intended for his life. God had plans to prosper him, give him a great future. And Jeremiah has been doing the ministry that God had called him to for several years now. But, you know, Jeremiah, you know, he, he was called to a hard ministry. He's called to preach into the lives of a people that have been disobedient for many years now. And Isaiah had already been preaching to this people, this Israelite people. These guys um, had a rich heritage with God. They had great times where God blessed their lives. They had good kings and they prospered under the good kings who led them into a relationship with God. But there was times where they had a lot of bad kings in their history. And uh, 
you know, they're at a very low point in life now. They're, in, they're at a low point, they're in a, in a very backslidden condition. The land's filled with idols, there's false gods, there's a lot of sin taking place in the land. And God is beginning to speak through the lives of the prophets into the life of this nation, trying to turn them around again. You know, tell them that if they'll just come back and amend their ways, that he'll forgive them and give them another chance. But over and over again, they don't hearken to the words of the prophets, and they continue to do their own thing. They continue to live their own way. And Jeremiah's um, being used by God to try to encourage them to return. But, um, you know, Jeremiah's looking around, and he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand why it seems like the, the, the ungodly people, they seem like they're getting over it seems like you know everything's running smoothly for them. They get wealthier and wealthier. They build bigger and bigger houses. They have nicer and nicer um, transportation and meals and all kinds of beautiful clothes to wear. And he just doesn't understand why, why, why are the wicked, it seems like they just keep prospering and everything go, runs smoothly for them. And God's trying to speak into this prophet's life. And he, he's basically telling them, you know, Jeremiah, if this stuff is troubling your mind, man, what are you going to do when things get worse? You know, and that's the way we are here in America, you know. America's been around for a long time, my friends, and um, most of, a lot of us in this room, we, we haven't experienced some of the, what the older people have experienced. America went through the Civil War. America went through the Great Depression. America went through World War I. America went through World War II. It went through the Vietnam War. It went through the Korean War. You know, and now we're at a time of basically peace for quite a few years now. And we're having trouble being Christians in a time of peace. And he's telling that this prophet, it's like, you know, you're struggling now, man. But, you know, I just told you that you need to prophesy to this people that King Nebuchadnezzar is going to come into this land and he's going to take over this place and he's going to destroy this city and, and, and you're going to be taken captive into a foreign land. If you can't hold up now, spiritually speaking, in time of peace, what are you going to do when the rug gets pulled out from under you? You know, and us as the people of God, if we can't handle it now in 2021, and we read the Bible, and we believe the Bible is true, and the disciples, they questioned Jesus on how it was going to be in the last days, and how it was going to be at the time of the end, and what was going to be the sign of his coming. And he spoke all this list of all these calamities that were going to take place in the earth. How are we going to possibly be able to withstand that mentally and spiritually if we can't handle it now in a time of peace? How are you going to handle it when there's false Christs and false prophets and false teachers and false doctrine and wars and famines and earthquakes and incurable diseases and hatred and betrayal? And the love of many waxing cold because wickedness is growing worse and worse. And perplexity and distress of nations and all these things that Jesus speaks about that are going to take place before the time of his second coming. How can, you, how can you hold up under that as a man or a woman of God? It's time, my friends, to make preparation now while things are easy or seemingly easy, not as bad as they have been in the past. I mean, people aren't jumping out of buildings because the financial condition of the country is, went, to, went, went away. You know, the Great Depression, many people, they had a really hard time. During the times of these wars, many, many, many young men were killed in battle. Amen. You know, America's going through a lot of, lot of, lot of hardships, a lot of, lot, of, lot of different travesties. But um, we can't even run with the footmen, he's saying. How are you going to deal with chariots? You know, a chariot's much faster than a, a, a runner, a footman. He's saying, if you can't deal with the footmen, how 
How are you going to deal with the chariots? If you can't measure up in a time of peace, what are you going to do when the Jordan swells up? See, when the Jordan swelled up, you know, all the lions and all the critters that would be roaming around that made their dens and right, right by the side of the river, you know, these animals, they would like to camp by the river so they could get their water on a daily basis. But when the Jordan swells up, these animals, these lions and all these things, they get thrown into the land. That's what he's telling them. He said, you know, you think you got hardship now. Wait till the lions start coming in and you're trying to harvest your crops and you're dealing with all these things. Amen. You know, and we, we murmur and complain as the people of God because we don't like the way the election turned out. We don't like COVID-19. And, uh, you know, none of these things um, are necessarily good. I'm not saying I like the way the election turned out, and this is not a political message, but, you know, maybe it would have been better if the other candidate won. I don't know. We'll, we'll never know that. We, get, we have the leader that we deserve as a nation. People always get the kind of leadership they deserve. Amen. And we, went, we might complain about the leaders that we get, but have we been praying for our leaders? Have we been fasting for our leaders? Have we been trying to write letters to our leaders? Have we been trying to make an impact in their lives? You know, and, you know we, can, we can complain, but what are we doing to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem? Amen. And God wants us to become part of the solution. Amen. And God wants us to not cave in when um, all hell breaks loose upon the earth. And I think about how the Bible teaches us that the devil, he roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The Bible teaches us in the Old Testament scriptures that Satan himself, he weakened the nations. He made the earth to tremble. He destroyed the cities thereof. And I'm not trying to bring any glory to Satan in any way, shape, or form. I serve Jesus. I don't serve Satan. But I want to understand as a realist what I'm up against. I'm no match for the devil and the evil spirits in my own strength. I have no, I have no ability to to defend myself against him aside from the Holy Spirit. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And until I access the power of the Holy Spirit within my life, the devil will defeat me time and time again. He'll present a temptation, and I'll go with it hook, line, and sinker. He'll present um, some, some kind of a fearful thing, and I'll become afraid. You know, we're like little pawns. Little pawns, we're being manipulated by Satan and the evil spirits until we surrender to Jesus. Until we bring our neck under his yoke. Until we allow the Holy Spirit to lead and direct our lives. We're like little puppets on a string. The devil says jump and we ask him how high. The devil shows us something that we shouldn't have and we go right after it because we want it. And we can't resist. Aside from the Holy Spirit, my friends. Paul the Apostle was, was, was probably much better than any of us will ever achieve as a Christian. And we can read in the book of Romans how he even struggled with the sinful nature. He says, the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. You know, the things I want to do, I don't do. He says, you know, in me that doesn't dwell any good thing, he says. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this body of sin? You know, but he doesn't leave us hanging. He tells us to read the way that we, the way out. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. You need Jesus, and I need Jesus. Amen. Jesus is not just something we talk about on a Sunday morning. Jesus is something that you need in your life. Without Jesus and without his, without the presence of the Holy Spirit, my friends, you're going to live a life of a failure. Whether you become rich and become a multimillionaire, a CEO in a big company. You might even go to Harvard, you might go to Yale, you might graduate with honors at the top of your class, and you might walk up the corporate ladder and have the biggest house in Boston, and have the finest car, and marry the most beautiful woman or the most handsome husband, and all these things you would have as accolades of what you did with your life, but when your life is all done and over, my friend, you live the life of a failure without Jesus. Jesus is your way out, my friends. Jesus is your ticket to paradise. The, the thief on the cross understood it. 
He lived the life of a career criminal. Two thieves got crucified alongside Jesus that day. And the Bible doesn't even name them by name. Their lives were a failure. Their whole lives, they were career criminals. They're labeled malefactors, which is a career criminal. That, that, that's the way the Bible labeled them. They did nothing right their whole life. They learned how to lie, cheat, and steal as a young age, and they continued to do that until they were older men, until the government finally caught up with them and sentenced the judgment that they were to get crucified on an old rugged cross. And they were crucified alongside Jesus. Their life's blood is bleeding out of them. One malefactor continues to harden his heart and continues to make fun of Jesus and rail on him and tell him, hey, you know, if you, you're who you say you are, save yourself and save us. And the other, the other criminal is going along with him for a while, but somewhere during this dying process, he came to his senses. And he began to realize, hey, this guy's not dying the way that we're dying. I don't see him cursing. I don't see him, you know, speaking bad of the Roman soldiers, the Roman government. He's dying in a peaceable way. He's dying with... With, with, with peace in his heart. There's nothing troubling Jesus. There's nothing troubling Jesus. He's dying not the way an ordinary man would die. And he says, and he says, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. See, he's, he's realizing that Jesus is who he said he was. That this isn't just an ordinary man that's dying alongside me. This is the Lord of glory. This is the creator of all mankind. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. One disciple says, Jesus, show us the Father, and that'll be enough. Jesus says, have I been with you such a long time and you don't know me? If you don't believe because of the words I speak, believe because of the very work's sake. Nobody did what Jesus did. He healed the blind, opened up their eyes, the deaf heard again, the dumb spoke again, the cripples walked again, demoniacs were healed again, demons were cast out, the dead rose to life again, thousands were fed with a little bit of fish and a little bit of, blood, little bit of bread, a man that had been dead four days was raised back to life again. Nobody did what Jesus did, he forgave sins, he received worship unto himself. He proved that he was God in the flesh. The Bible says if we don't believe that he's he, we'll die in our sins. If you don't believe that Jesus wasn't just an ordinary man, I mean, he was a prophet, he was a teacher, he was a carpenter's son, he was a carpenter in his own right. He did a lot of great things in his life. But the most important thing he was to us is he was our Savior. He was the only one. There's no other blood that's powerful enough to wash away sins. None of us ever lived a sinless life except for Jesus. He had to be perfect. He could never make a mistake if he was going to pay the sacrifice for our sins. He never made one mistake, never said a wrong word, never spoke a lie, never stole anything, never spoke bad to his parents. All, over and over again, he always kept the Sabbath day holy. He, always, he did everything that was pleasing to the Father. And because of that, he was able to be our ransom sacrifice. Amen. He was able to be our sin bearer. He's able to be our advocate with the Father, our mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus is able to pay the sin debt. And, and this, this guy, he finally figured it out. He's dying. Dying on the old rugged cross. Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. When he, when he, when he said that word, Lord, he, he wasn't just, it wasn't just an ordinary word. See, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 4, I believe it's 35 and 39, it says the Lord is God and there's none other. And Jesus says in John chapter 13, verse 13, he says, you call me master and Lord and you say well for so am I. Jesus told Peter, who do men say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And it wasn't upon Peter, because Peter went on to deny him three times. He wasn't going to build a church on Peter's life. He was going to build the church on the profession of Peter's faith and who Christ said he was. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. 
See, when we get that type of knowledge and understanding into our heart, we can become born again if we'll just repent of our sins. So we believe that he died on an old rugged cross and he rose from the dead and we confess him as Lord and Savior and we repent of our sins, we become born again. And that's what this is all about, my friends. If we're going to ever deal with the swelling of the Jordan, we're going to have to deal with it in the spirit, my friends. You're not going to be able to withstand all that the world has to throw at your life if you can't have the Holy Spirit in your life, my friends. Because life is, going to, life is not easy. Life's not easy for none of us. You know, there's going to be deaths in the family. Mom and dad are going to die someday. Maybe your brother or sister is going to die someday. Maybe some of you are going to get cancer. Maybe some of you are going to get heart disease. Maybe someone's house is going to burn down or a hurricane is going to blow it away. There's going to be jobs that are going to be lost. There's going to be a lot of things you're going to go through, my friends, if you're going to ever make it to the other side. If you live to be as long as me and the, the other brother there, we get gray hair, we look in the mirror, you know, we realize our time is short. You live as long as us, you're going to go through a lot of different things. I think of in my own life, you know, as times I had guns pointed at me several times. I, w I, I was confronted with an angry man with a baseball bat, another man, a, another person uh, was ready to stab me with a knife. I was chased with a broken bottle. I was drugged one time. All these different things I went through. You know, failed relationships, financial problems, sicknesses in my body. But you know, I'm still here. I'm still here by the grace of God. I'm still here because I put my, I put my confidence in Christ. I put my faith in Jesus. And I, and, and, and I rely upon the Holy Spirit. I rely upon him. I realize that, you know, that, 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 I, that I would have failed a long time ago. They would have had me in a psych ward and put me, put me all kinds of medication. My mind wouldn't have been able to comprehend all the things that I've gone through in this life. But because of Jesus, I made a decision at age 29 I was going to follow Jesus. And I've never turned back, my friends. I might have stumbled along the way, but I continued to keep the plow to the ground and not look back and continue to go on in the things of God and continue to get up and pray and continue to read the word of God and continue to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and continue to do all I can to help other people, my friends, have a relationship with Christ and come into the saving knowledge of Jesus. And we continue to preach revivals because we know that the church in America is primarily primarily backslidden, my friends, that the church is falling apart for the most part, spiritually speaking, and people's hearts need to be revived. They need to get ready for the coming of the Lord because Christ is coming soon, my friends. And without times of refreshing from his presence, without the church beginning to pray as they've never prayed before, my friends, how, you can, how can you stand against the against the, such, the swelling of the Jordan when the, the river flows over and the lions are invading the land and you're trying to harvest your crops. How could you possibly deal with that in America as things get worse and worse because America continues to be more sinful? And don't, don't mind me, I'm, I'm as patriotic as the next person. I love this nation. It's the land of my forefathers. It's the land where my dad died, my grandfather died. I love America. But I know America's gone a, the wrong way a long time now, my friends. And it's not the nation it once was. And we need to be part of the solution instead of the part of the problem. We need to begin to pray and pray the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous people, my friends. And realize it's not going to get any easier until Christ returns. It's going to grow harder and harder. And if your prayer life is not established, my friends, you're not going to survive it, spiritually speaking. You're going to become a casualty of war. The Bible says before Christ returns in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that there will be a falling away that will come first. People falling away from the faith. And that has already started, my friends. That's probably been going on for over a decade now. That's why the churches, they don't have the attendance that they once had because people are being tried in the balance and many are being found lacking my friends. Many are trying to flesh this thing out. They're trying to walk a life that pleases God in their own strength. They don't take time to pray. They don't take time to read the Bible. They hardly go to church anymore. Worshiping God is a thing of the past because they're, they're so condemned in their own spirit, in their own soul. How could they possibly worship God? I think of the, the, the Israelites as they're down, by the, they're down by the river now. They're down by the river. 
They're in captivity in Babylon. Jeremiah had been prophesying to them. And now, the, now their captors are mocking them. They're telling them, sing us one of the songs of Zion. You know, show us some joy and peace in your eyes. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And they're saying, to the, they're saying, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? In other words, they weren't prepared. You know, that's what God's telling Jeremiah. Tell this people, you know, you need to prepare because you're going into captivity. You know, we spoke about that last night. But you're going into captivity, and there's nothing going to stop that because you've been sinning for a long time, and I've executed this judgment. And he, and he told them, he said, those that, will, those that will won't fight against Nebuchadnezzar when he comes to take over this land. If you won't fight against my judgment, if you'll submit to what I'm, uh, what I'm, what I'm requiring from your life, he says, you're going you're gonna to prosper in your captivity. But those that want to fight against my judgment, those that want to continue to go on in their sinfulness and not accept my plan for their life, will not put their neck under the yoke that I'm asking you to put, put your neck under. I'm telling you, sometimes God requires hard things from us. You know, it's not easy to follow Jesus. I think of some of these missionaries, they go into these foreign lands. I think of this one missionary. He went into this place and um, they didn't believe in God. Or they were, they were a, a, a tribe, a secluded tribe, and a, they were cannibalistic. And he went and preached Jesus to them. And um, somehow along the way, they, 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 they killed the man, and his wife came back later, but they, they had accepted Jesus. But that's where God sent him. Not because it was an easy thing for him to do to lose his life, but because God loved those people. And if he had to sacrifice one of his servants to save a whole tribe of people, he was willing to do that because the guy was ready to meet him anyway. This guy was going to heaven. You know, so if his life had to be sacrificed for the sake of that whole tribe of people, both were being benefited. He was going home, and the tribe was going to be saved. You know, sometimes God he requires hard things. The Father required that Jesus would die on an old rugged cross. And Jesus went to the garden, and he prayed three times, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. In other words, I, I don't really want to do this. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. In other words, he, he continued to put his neck under the yoke of the Father. The Father was taking him to a hard place. You know, just like the Father took a lot of his servants to hard places in the past. And he's probably going to take a lot of us to hard places. But the Bible says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And we have a bright future ahead of us, even though we might go through hard times to get there. The Bible says we'll be heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. We'll go to a place where there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more death. The former things will pass away. He'll make all things new. You'll go to a place where one day is like a million years that your life will just go on and on and on and there'll be no more dealing with the devil there'll be no more dealing with the evil spirits there'll be no more temptation you'll be an overcomer you'll be more than a conqueror through him who first loved you but you gotta you, 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 you gotta make a decision this morning a decision that while we're still in a place where we can still worship God in the house of God. We could still pray without being hindered. We could still read the Bible. We could still have a Bible. We could still go to church. You know, we could still congregate as the, the people of God. You know, there's places in the world you can't even do what we're doing this morning. You go to China, you, you're not going to be able to do this kind of thing. We're not going to be able to preach like this. You're not going to be able to, to do the things that we do here in America. And maybe these freedoms are not going to last much longer here. And it's time for you as the people of God to begin to prepare for hard times up ahead. I'm telling you, make no mistake about it, that's not going to get any easier. It's only going to get harder. And I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom and gloom. I just want to understand that the Bible is being fulfilled. And every word's going to come to pass that Jesus said. There's no mistakes in the Bible. There's no, there's no, Jesus didn't make any mistakes, and he's not amending any of the scriptures. What he said is going to happen. And it's time for us as the people of God, my friends, to prepare for the coming of the Lord. To begin to awake out of our slumber, begin to wake out of our sleep. If we really want to be a people of revival, 
we got to do the things that a, re a revivalist and a people of revival do. They pray. They humble themselves. They seek his face. They turn from their wicked ways. They submit to God. They resist the devil. They draw nigh to God. They let their laughter be turned into mourning. Their joy into heaviness. They humble themselves in the sight of God, and God revives them. And God wants to revive you, and he wants to revive me. And that's what this altar is for, my friends. Let's come to the altar as a church family, and let's pray for a genuine revival, not just a weekend event. We want to see revival that takes place and lasts, my friends. And we want to be able to stand when the Jordan swells over or when all hell breaks loose here in America because it's going to get worse and worse, my friends. And I don't want to scare anybody, but if that's what it takes to get you straight with God, let it happen. You know, Come to the altar and let's pray as a church family.
traditional hymn that uh, the words are outstanding when you think about it, when you hear them, but we've kind of rearranged it a little bit.
then we always turn to the cross. The old rugged cross. The old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross with a and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it on dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will sing home far away where his glory 